Okay, now that we have made this observation, let's build our transistor. So here I'm showing actually the 3D kind of a drawing of a transistor or a MOSFET, uh, a 2D side view picture of the same kind of structure and a symbol of a MOSFET. We're going to talk about each of them one by one. Let's start with the 3D one. So I have the three layers. They're not actually the same size in terms of like size. You can see that I have the top layer, the top conductive plate, which is this, this layer here. Um, and I'm going to call whatever is connected, like this layer, uh, I'm going to call it gate, or like basically the terminal that is connected to this layer, I'm going to call it gate. And then I have this middle insulator layer. So let's call it insulator. And this was basically the top conductor or conductive layer or like that metal that we mentioned or something close to metal or similar to metal and then in the bottom one the bottom layer which was supposed to be p-type semiconductor you can see that it's actually a pretty big one right it's not just a small plate like these ones right the reason for that is that well we call this uh, p-type semiconductor the p-substrate and the reason is that it's a substrate for all transistors that we're going to build on a single chip or a single integrated circuit, a single IC. So if you're actually talking about like a, C a chip for a CPU of a computer or a cell phone, all transistors that could be like, there could be like millions or billions of transistors, all those transistors on that chip are going to have the same substrate. They're going to share the same substrate. Okay. But then the other two layers, the insulator and the, well, the conductive plate on the top that is connected to the gate, they're going to be basically dedicated for each transistor. In addition to this, I'm going to have two other terminals because, well, in the end, I'm going to make a three terminal device called transistor. So I'm going to have two other terminals, drain and source. And in a, in a moment, I'm going to tell you why do we need them and why do we name them drain and source. And uh, to connect them, it turns out that like it's not really a good idea to connect wires, which are metal to a uh, piece of straight directly simply because it don't produce a good ohmic contact, meaning that if they're going to, by ohmic contact, I mean a, a type of a contact that is basically, it, it, it allows for um, direct a current in both directions. Like for example, we had PN contact, like basically that we, we built using, like when we were building diodes and you saw that like that kind of contact only allows current in one direction. Ohmic contact means that it's kind of like a resistor. We wanted to make sure that this resistor is actually low resistance, and then we want to make sure that the current goes both directions in these, like basically in these contacts. So it turns out that like we cannot connect metal to piece substrate directly. The reason for that is basically outside the, the scope of this course, but we need to have a, a region or basically an area called um, N plus diffusion. So we, we actually uh, diffuse N plus or basically n-type semiconductor atoms into this uh, piece of substrate and create this n-plus diffusion and then connect the drain to it. I do We do the same thing on the other side. So you can see that this, this device is perfectly symmetric um, along the x-axis, right? So you can see that the two sides of the gate are pretty, pretty much identical to each other, okay? We're gonna call one of these sides drain and the other side source. Which one is which? doesn't really matter like once you decide that this is source and that's drain that, that like you once you actually build your transistor you can actually call whichever you want source or drain uh, what makes them really source or drain is really well how you connect them in a circuit because once you actually connect them to the circuit depending on what is the voltage connected to each of these like either of these two terminals one of them is going to be basically sourcing uh, some free carriers and the other one is going to be draining some free carriers and that's why we name them source and drain so depending on like which one of them is providing this uh, charge carriers and which one of them is actually draining them or collecting them let's say similar to emitter and collector um, basically depending on that you're going to basically call one of them source and the other one drain so this is one of the differences between bipolar or bjt and mosfet that well other than the fundamental difference that their, their, their structure is completely different over there. We had P-type and N-type and P-type or NPN structure. Here we have metal and uh, insulator and semiconductor. One of the other differences is that, well, with MOSFETs, we have a symmetric device. So source and drain have no, dif like there's no difference between them inherently. Uh, but with BGT, well, they were actually different. So emitter was always emitter and it, it couldn't be collector and vice versa. Okay, now looking at the 2D 
picture has some basically interesting uh, could give us some interesting insight for example the reason we have this drain and source you might wonder why do i need them it's basically to have that v2 that we talked about right so at the end of the day i wanted to have horizontal current like basically or current that is moving horizontally under the gate so i can apply some v2 here uh, with drain having higher voltage than the source and you can see that well because of that and uh well first let's talk about the gate so i'm going to apply this v2 and then on the other side for the gate let me use a different color i have the gate because i want to actually apply that v1 that we talked about in the previous slide between gate and the substrate and the substrate you can assume that it's always connected to ground okay so this is going to be v1 so what happens is that once i apply v1 i'm going to have well we're going to talk a little bit more details uh, talk about this process in a lot more details in the few, next few slides but then uh, uh, the gist of it is that i'm going to have a lot of negative charges here simply because i applied positive voltage at the gate so i'm going to have a lot of negative charges here and then once i apply v2 these negative charges are going to be basically moving from um, source to drain so i'm going to have a current from drain to the source okay so this is the direction of the current this is the direction of electrons okay so electrons are going to be moving from source to drain because well they're being sourced by the source and they're being drained by the drain and the current therefore is going to be the opposite of the electrons and it's going to be going from drain to source okay so this is how i actually make my transistor so i have three different um, terminals source and drain i just talked about them and then the the, the the role of gate here is that it's kind of like we call it gate simply because it's kind of a gatekeeper for this channel of electrons right so if i increase this v1 i'm going to have more electrons here so i'm going to have more current flowing through here right if i have less v1 or like basically make this v1 equal to zero you can imagine that there's not going to be any free electron here or any significant free electron so i'm actually reducing the current significantly or, or i might even make it zero right so it's kind of like it, it gives you the idea it gives the impression that we have a device again that the flow of current between two terminals drain and source is controlled by a third terminal that is gate we had the kind of a kind of a similar thing with bjt's right so with bjt's we had a base that was controlling the current that is that was flowing from collector to emitter or vice versa for pmp transistors right so here again we have a voltage controlled current that is flowing between two terminals this is basically we have a current between drain and source that is controlled by the voltage at the gate okay we're going to talk a lot more about this and basically we're going to model this and we're going to find that the expression for that current and then find out how to use that expression in our analysis okay so let's take a look at the material and the dimensions of the device that we just described Okay. so we said that the top metal layer or the top conductive layer is actually a metal and that's why mosfet is called mosfet because m is actually standing for metal um, actually in the early early days in the early generations of moss we, people were actually using metals but they were using aluminums for this top conductive layer right but then later on people realized that if they use a type of a non-crystalline silicon which we call polysilicon or sometimes in short poly uh, with heavy doping like you dope it with a lot of uh, free free charge carriers uh, so it actually is very it has a very low resistivity so it is kind of like a metal so it's very very conductive um, it's actually better to use them simply because they in during the fabrication and basically due to their physical properties um, at like basically when you're actually fabricating a transistor and using very high temperatures in the in the fabrication of these transistors uh, the physical properties of this polysilicon is actually better than the aluminum you can imagine that aluminum has like some melting point and then at some certain temperatures they're going to melt away with the, like that's one of the reasons the polysilicon well the melting point is actually a lot higher okay so although we're using polysilicon today as the top conductive uh, layer we don't call it uh, polysilicon oxide uh, semiconductor which is we still call it metal oxide semiconductor right but then you can imagine that met, like you can now know that uh, that metal is not really a metal it's a polysilicon as for the insulator 
As I mentioned before, it's basically we call it oxide, and it's because we use something called silicon dioxide as the insulator in the middle layer. So that's basically this one. So as I mentioned here, uh, it's created by growing silicon dioxide or simply oxide on top of the silicon area. So you have a piece of silicon, the P-type material, you grow some silicon dioxide on top of it, and then on top of that, you will have this polysilicon. And then on the bottom, you have your P-type material, P-substrate. Now, the oxide, as I mentioned before, the thickness of this oxide, or T-ox, is in the order of 18 angstrom. Angstrom is 10 to the power of negative 10, so 1 angstrom is 0.1 nanometer. So 18 angstrom is somewhere around 1.8 nanometers. Okay? Um, the distance between drain and source, it's called, like as I mentioned, this is basically where the electrons are actually moving from left to right, from left to right to right to left. So we call this a channel, and basically this length we're going to call channel length. It's almost the most famous feature, or like basically feature size in a in a MOSFET. So whenever people want to talk about the technology, they always talk about the smallest channel length that you could have in that technology. Right, so this is basically here. You can see that the channel length is 90 nanometer. So basically, the smallest channel length for a transistor. I'm not talking about the feature size because you saw that the oxide thickness could be two nanometers. I'm talking about the distance between drain and source. Okay, like basically the distance that people could realize um, is going to be the channel length. And then when you're talking about the technology that is a 90 nanometer technology. Or CMOS te or MOSFET technology, it means that uh, the transistors that are built using that technology, using that fabrication technology, uh, are going to be either having channel length that are 90 nanometer or larger than that, or longer than that. The length of the channel cannot be smaller than that. Now, if you look at today's CPUs, like if you go online and search for this latest CPU by Intel, latest Core i7 or Core i9 or whatever um, it is out there. Um, you're going to see that the latest CPUs are actually built using 14 nanometer technology or 10 nanometer technology. Whatever uh, they report, they always mention that like this is a CPU, this is a Core i7 CPU with the maximum clock frequency of blah blah gigahertz or megahertz. And then uh, they also mention this 10 nanometer or 14 nanometer. It doesn't mean that the chip, the entire chip, is in the order of like 10 nanometer. That would be awesome, but well, we're we're still light years away from there. But uh, the chip could be like in the centimeter scale, but then what they're actually referring to by that 10 nanometer or 14 nanometer is the length of this channel. As I mentioned before, the entire CPU is actually using, uh, is built using MOSFETs. Again, to, to know uh, that the importance of this type of transistor compared to the BJT. Okay. Now, and then in, the, in addition to these things, you have these N plus diffusions that uh, you have here and here using n-type material and then you might wonder that well you have a p-type substrate you have an n-type material so you're going to have a p-n junction between the two so you're going to have some diodes here what about them well the good news about these diodes the good news because they're not going to add to the complexity of our analysis is that because p substrate the substrate as you will see later it's always connected to the smallest or lowest voltage in our or lowest potential in our circuit so like, for example, it's always connected to ground or if you have negative voltage, it's going to it's going to be connected to the most negative voltage in our circuit. Then you can you can be sure and you can be confident that this diode is always in reverse bias. Right. So like basically uh, the drain and source are going to be whatever voltage they take is going to be either equal in the worst case scenario or larger than the substrate. So this diode never turns on. So you can just basically ignore that, at least for the frequencies that we care about. You can just simply ignore the existence of this diet. 